Sometimes it looks like magic when you're five years old and all stretched out on the old leather couch that takes up most of your grandparents' living room, where there is a tree bigger than a man but not as big as your grandpa and it is covered in rainbow lights and you almost know what safety is. Beneath that tree, there is a city, an entire universe blanketed in snow, and a train that your grandfather built with his very own hands. There are tinier trees that you imagine are always worth climbing. If you get to the top, you can see the entire world in all its celebration. There is a mirrored pond where the tiny people skate, a man with a dog, a band of carol singers who know every word to every song, and a horse-drawn carriage. Here, all the roofs are covered in glitter. Hot chocolate is on every stove, and there is an endless supply of sugar. A tiny light is always on. Every other window holds a welcoming. Your mother is asleep in the room she grew up in, and you have finally fled that lonely place with the angry man and the angry fists. You are not his child, but he left bruises on your bones like birthmarks. You know these are the only gifts some men learn how to give. Maybe he thought you were an angel, like the one on top of the tallest tree, tried to teach you to fly with his empty hands. You fight off sleep like a champion, counting tinsel instead of sheep, worrying that Santa won't know where to find you since you moved in the nighttime, ran away in the dark. These kind of miracles do not have your address. They do not know where you live. They will find you anyway. Sometimes it looks like release. When you're 16 years old and you've swallowed the dark, when you're sitting in the glow of the twinkling lights and the silence is screaming and you found the only knife your mother forgot to hide, when you are alone with the Kalanapin and the Prozac, alone with the gifts you have received from your father, a tradition of sorts. No one knows exactly where it started. There is no star pointing to this kind of Bethlehem. You are convinced that you carry the night inside you, an obscene guardian. It has been with you since you learned to walk. Your father, he put it there with his hands, his mouth, with all of the things he thinks makes him a man. You want to cut it out of you. Want to draw a thin red line between you and your history. Want to stifle the music in your throat like hallelujah, like grace. All the truth your family didn't want you to sing. All the honest they never wanted to hear. So they stopped listening. And you don't know the words anymore. And you just want to be quiet. You want it to be finished. And you look up and all you see is lights which just might be stars, which just might be heaven. You feel hope. You choose to live. Two years later, you will find yourself on his doorstep, arms full of nothing but all of your fight and all of your tell-off, and you will see him barely standing in all of his grief, and you will find your miracle. You will find your forgiveness. There is no snow in San Diego, but you are convinced you know a thing or two about coming in from the cold. Sometimes it looks like desperation when you're 26 and your stepfather comes to your door bitter and wasted. He has spent another day trying to find his future at the bottom of the bottle, trying to find his savior in some kind of speed because the summer brought with it news that his body is killing him. And he is far too young for all of this death. And can you blame him, really? 
You thought this time was supposed to be sacred, and you thought this time was supposed to be special, but he's staggering in at midnight, hollering at the top of his twisted lungs, singing every word to every song, screaming that you are worth nothing, that you are a waste, that you will never do anything with your stupid fucking life, and you believe him. And so you run right into the arms of the ex-boyfriend who doesn't really love you but will keep you for the night. And you give him all that you have just to feel like something other than all of that nothing. And you wake up in the morning. Sometimes it looks like loneliness. When you're 27 years old with nowhere to go, and there is still so much day and still so much night left to fill with something, anything that looks like happiness. When your mother is in another city, in another state, and your grandmothers are gone, and you're not speaking to your father because time and prison have taught him nothing, and this ache is everything, it is far too familiar. You find yourself at the doors to this church where you never found Jesus, where you never belonged, and you're searching for some kind of memory, just some kind of recognition in some kind of scripture in the holy stained glass, and the doors are locked. So you find your way to the nearest step, and you give yourself up to all of this sadness because this God that you sometimes believe in says, This is not a place for hiding. And your phone rings. Sometimes it looks like answering. It's the night where you finally allow yourself to get ugly, where you dance with the girls in some hotel lobby beneath someone else's tree, an entire world in all of its celebration. It's the time when you meet up at the deli on the corner with the family who chose you, a band of warriors singing all the grace. You forget the words, but these miracles, they show up anyway. You are bound together by nothing but stories, and yet they speak your heart like gospel, give it back to you on the coldest day. It's the hour you realize that every track you've laid has led you here, that life will always find a way to move forward, that you can build it stronger with your very own hands, and that this in itself is a kind of homecoming. It's the moment you see that the darkness that comes with this season, with life, can be a gift of sorts. You will wake up in the morning, and it won't always look like magic. But somewhere, a tiny light is always on, and every other window holds a welcoming. Tim Pappas.